Hello and welcome to episode 311 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm good, Andy. It's been a busy budget week. So the budget always throws up a lot of work for us because it's obviously lots of things get announced. Everybody wants some analysis. And it was really good this time because there were there's so many of us in the team that we were able to do different bits and pieces, watch the budget live, be able to push out stuff on social media. And of course, Laura, who is the exciting thing that's happening this week. Laura is back on the show. We invited her back because Laura loves covering the budget. It's the sort of thing that she would have done in her pre-Money to the Masses career. And so we've got her back on the show to talk about the budget. So it's, a, it's an interesting week because a lot can happen. You never quite know with a budget what's going to come out the other side. And you see lots of other people speculate about what's going to come out in a budget. And I don't do that. You'll notice we never talk about a budget beforehand because it doesn't seem any point speculating. So yeah, it was a busy week, Andy. You get a lot of stuff. It gets in the way and it means you end up working late at the end of the week trying just to play catch up with everything else. But apart from that, everything else is all good and the kids are going back to school on Monday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something to always to look forward to. So you mentioned the budget there. I suppose getting into the podcast itself, we're not a podcast that talks newsy type stuff we try and make it evergreen try and make it actionable but once in a while with something so big as this with so much that's come out of it we've decided that we're pretty much going to focus on that for this podcast and we've got a guest coming up on the show as well haven't we Demi? yep so laura welcome back to the show hi there hello so laura is our credit editor but also writes about investing and pensions and in her background is actually investing as well in her past in her previous part of her career so she covers a lot of the stuff to do with the budget so we brought Laura back because she sat there and watched every part of the budget and I think if Laura was honest she quite likes it (laughs) yeah I have to admit it is yeah strangely enjoyable I get quite caught up I know we don't speculate at money to the masses but I get caught up in reading all of the preamble to it and I think especially this year which is you know, it was always going to be an interesting budget, a historic budget. You know, we're in, as we keep saying, unprecedented times. And actually, in the end, the but it didn't disappoint in terms of big announcements, big changes. So yeah, it was an exciting, an exciting budget to cover. So one thing I just want to give it some context, because ahead of this budget, there was quite a bit of speculation that we were going to get some big tax hikes potentially to pay for all the pandemic support that's been happening in the last year or so. So that was the context that people were fearing that, for example, income tax, capital gains tax, all these things could suddenly rise. And as an overall view of it, Laura, was it that tax grabbing budget or was it a fairly generous budget before we get into the nitty gritty detail? Yeah, I mean, I think how I'd characterise it overall is there are lots of like short term gains for people in terms of like support, continuing pandemic recovery support. But there was also the promise of, I guess, longer term pain, a lot of kind of stealth tax cuts, really, they didn't make any changes to income tax, national insurance. And those were part of their uh, manifesto and pledges before they were elected. So I think that those those elements were safe. But in terms of the personal income tax allowance, the higher rate threshold, and also capital gain tax threshold, inheritance tax, the pension type lifetime allowance those have all been frozen until 2026 so as we've sort of talked about before on the podcast that kind of inflation effect is that kind of stealth tax cut that people are definitely going to start feeling as, as time goes on so you mentioned there laura that the first takeaway for people is that income tax rates didn't go up capital gains tax didn't go up. People were thinking that that might happen. Inheritance tax rates obviously didn't change. They don't ever tend to. But the allowances and all these things were frozen, which you mentioned. So the headlines might make it out that people aren't paying any more tax. Their take. I mean, I saw one that, that Sunak actually said himself that people's take home pay won't be lower. But of course, it goes back to this stealth tax idea that we talked about in episode 281, so 281, which it was quite interesting that we did that show 
about six months ago. It was in July last year. And here we are in March 2021 with a brilliant example of how governments use stealth taxation and tax bracket creep. So I'm not going to dwell too much on it on this show because you go back to that show, it explains it all in more detail. But in essence, the rate of taxation doesn't go up, the percentage, but the bracket stays the same So it means, doesn't it, Law, that over time, inflation does a lot of the heavy lifting for the government and we effectively get taxed more. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, we need to keep in mind the spending review that we saw in the autumn and the fact that there's going to be, if that carries on as planned, significant uh, spending cuts as well. So I think with the best will in the world, people are going to start to feel this as time goes on. And yeah, there is pain to come, unfortunately. So one of the things is by inflation, people are hopefully going to earn more over time. That's just naturally what tends to happen with inflationary pay rises. But also that means that if you move up into the next tax bracket, for example, because like the higher tax rate threshold has been frozen, then more of your money will be taxed. So although your take home pay won't be less because you earn more money, and therefore you will get some of the extra money above that new tax threshold in your pocket, you are actually paying more tax overall. So that's the issue I think that a lot of people have that I saw statistics quoting about an extra 1.3 million people in the UK are going to start paying income tax over the next five years. So it's the stealth part. We are actually end up paying more. I mean, this is a bit of speculation, but do you think that, okay, the allowances that we're focusing on at the moment, the thresholds are frozen. Do you think that there is going to be tax hikes in the future anyway? So at the moment they're frozen, but is the the word on the street that they think that the government's going to end up hiking them anyway? Um, Yeah, there was nothing certain uh, laid out about future tax hikes. I think, though, it seems as if it's inevitable that at some point that is going to happen. Sunak made it really clear in the budget that borrowing needs to come under control uh, after this initial uh, period of recovery um, is is over. Uh, He also stated that it's going to be the work of many governments over many decades to repay this debt. So it seems inevitable in a way that at some point tax is going to have to go up in one area or another. I think he was fairly shrewd, actually because of like using inflation to effectively tax people by stealth but then also inflation is pretty good for clearing debt over the long term because it actually reduces the value of it in real terms let's jump across to different types of people so one of the things that did stand out for me is the impact on business owners and in particular corporation tax yeah that was an interesting one i i I think that was the big announcement really in terms of a hike now is this uh, this plan to increase that tax to 25%. I mean, albeit that is only for the largest companies, really, there's still going to be a small profit band for those companies with profits of less than £50,000. And then a sliding scale from that 19%. Only companies with profits over £250,000 will then pay that full 25%. Um, And the other thing to note is that's not due to come in for another two years. So there's still time that these kind of initial plans may change. I mean, it'd be interesting to see actually what changes happen as we get nearer to the next election and some of that sort of political positioning starts coming into play as well. Obviously, for business owners and small business owners, that would be a bit of a kick in the teeth by trying to get companies to pay for the spending that is going to continue, but also the stuff that's happened in the past. What was the good news for business owners? Yeah, so on on the more positive side of things, Sunak announced this, what he claimed was a sort of groundbreaking scheme, something that's never been tried in the UK before, which is this idea of trying to free up some of the money that some businesses have been managing to put aside during this time to really encourage business investment. Uh, so he has announced this scheme where if companies make an investment in their business, that they can deduct 130% of that cost from their tax bill. And he gave the example of in the past, if a company invested, say, £10,000, they would have been only been able to claim back 
I think around two and a half thousand pounds, whereas now they'd be able to claim back 13,000 pounds and deduct that from their tax bill. So that's quite revolutionary, really, to really encourage that level of investment and to really incentivize business owners to do that. Added to that, there was a 3,000 pound incentive to take on apprentices, which is an increase. Previously, they were being offered 1,500 pounds to take on apprentices. That's gone up. And there's also other more kind of niche schemes that are aimed at smaller businesses. So they have this management training idea for small businesses to be able to um, undertake some really high level training for their middle management or senior management. And that's going to be 90% funded by the government. And on top of that, there's also, again, for small businesses, free online technology advice, and also a 50% discount on particular productivity software up to a value of about £5,000. So that's also sort of pushing this idea of a strong recovery and a real focus on this digital-led uh, recovery. The fact that a lot of businesses have already had to embrace this new digital world over the course of the pandemic and the government's really keen for that to continue. Right, that's the businesses covered but let's move on to individuals now and in particular like the the furlough scheme there was news surrounding the furlough scheme yeah it became quite clear even before the budget that it was really likely that the government was going to extend the furlough scheme or as by its proper name the coronavirus job retention scheme you know it's really been the crown jewel of their recovery support it's gone far beyond what other countries have have offered and I think that they're keen to continue with it they've now committed to retaining the scheme until the end of September Um, And yeah, it's still going to continue to pay 80% of wages for the hours that people can't work because of the pandemic. Yeah, which is is a massive boost to people who may have felt that their jobs were under threat. I mean, I have to say that on the flip side of that, they're still anticipating that unemployment is going to top out at about 6.5% by the middle of next year. So there is still a sense of some of this pain being delayed. But in the short to medium term, this is going to help a lot of people. I noticed that duty on fuel and spirits, wine bill, those were frozen for the second year running. I'm guessing that part of that is because they want the economy to open up again. And also when pubs can eventually open up again. They want to don't want to hamper the hospitality industry. And I I reckon they're probably making enough money from people buying beer and stuff anyway, en masse because of lockdown, that they don't need to increase that. So if we move over to the self-employed, I think this was an area that a lot of people were eager to see what Sunak would do. So what what did the self-employed get out of this budget? Yeah, I mean, it was good news for a lot of self-employed people. I think a lot of people who this time last year were newly self-employed felt a little bit hung out to dry. They weren't um, eligible for those initial grants that were given to self-employed people because they hadn't submitted their tax return for that previous tax year. So yeah, now every Everyone who filed a tax return by midnight on the 2nd of March is eligible for the fourth and fifth grant. So the the fourth grant is going to cover the period from February to April. And then the fifth and final grant covers the period from May until September. And sort of similar to the furlough scheme, really, it covers 80% of that three month trading profits up to uh, £7,500. So that's for people whose trading profits have fallen by more than 30%. If your trading profits have fallen by less than 30%, then you will still qualify for a 30% grant. So yeah, the headlines were 600,000 people are now included in that scheme that were excluded before. I think it was slightly misleading, this idea that it had somehow been made more generous Actually, it was just by the fact that 
those people have now managed to submit their tax returns for the for the last tax year that they're now included it hasn't really been an extra sort of show of generosity from the government so that was one of the things that i remember you and i were talking about actually after the budget it seems to be they've extended the scheme but it's almost just by pure time which is unfortunate because the people now who qualify they can't backdate and go back and get money they would have wanted for the like you say the first second third part of that grant it's only now going forward isn't it that they're eligible to actually claim some money yeah I mean it's still going to help a lot of people don't get me wrong but I think that there has been a real section of society that has been excluded just by bad luck really from the support that's been given so generously to other people and it it has been unfortunate I mean it's good now that those people are going to get some help whether it's a bit too little too late I don't know so to reiterate people had to file their 2019-2020 tax return before midnight on March the 2nd but the, the, I suppose the bad news is that it wasn't all encompassing there was still plenty of people that were excluded so there's still plenty of people who are self-employed contract workers freelancers that are still excluded and in particular company directors or employees who were denied furlough because they may have been zero hour contract workers they still aren't included in this. So there are still a whole bunch of people that are excluded, which is obviously something that is disappointing. Now, to move on from the self-employed and individuals, I mean, I think I'll just quickly mention that I, I saw that the universal credit was extended for a further six months, the £20 temporary rise, and, and those on working tax credit will receive a one of £500 payment. Now it's almost the, the slightly headline grabbing part of the whole budget, which is home buyers. So Laura, take it away. Explain what's going on with the home buying part of the budget. Yeah, again, there was lots of speculation leading up to this. A lot of people in the middle of that home buying process was starting to panic because the stamp duty holiday was due to end at the end of March and with a huge backlog of on things like searches and the the kind of conveyancing side of things people were really worried that they were going to miss this deadline and then suddenly be hit with a much larger stamp duty bill luckily enough for those people it has now been extended so uh, luckily for those people it has been extended until the end of June it's going to stay as is. So stamp duty will be exempt up to a value of £500,000. And then from the end of June until the end of September, it's going to drop down to a limit of £250,000. And then from the end of September onwards, it will go back to its normal level of £125,000. I think the idea is that the government didn't want it just to kind of fall off of a cliff edge and, and for people to be suddenly faced with this much larger bill this way there's a bit of of a taper a bit of time for for adjustment and I mean to be honest we're still seeing a really um, buoyant housing market there's still rises in house prices there's still a lot of activity in that in that sector and and I think it's going to only continue uh, on the back of this news yeah so in addition to the stamp duty there was also the announcement of a new more mortgage guarantee scheme uh, because we've I mean we've certainly seen it lenders have been pulling those 95% loan to value products and but it was becoming really tricky for especially for those um, first time buyers who are trying to desperately save up a deposit there's now an incentive from government to lenders to start to offer those 95% LTV products again which again is going to be great news for for home buyers so I know there'll be a whole bunch of people out there who are thinking, right, do we still move? And they're going to listen to the podcast and go off and be talking in their kitchens about, shall we move, whispering while the neighbours can't hear. But just to put it into perspective, if you completed a house purchase, and let's say the house price was up to £500,000, you wouldn't have paid any or you don't pay any stamp duty as long as that's completed by the 30th of June. In the bit between that Laura was talking about, between the 1st of July and the 30th of December, then you will be paying the 5% stamp duty rate on the 250 up to £925,000. So the old rates start creeping back in. What that means is you will then be paying a stamp duty amount of £12,500, more than what you would do if you completed by the 30th of June. 
that's assuming your house price is above £500,000. So from 1st of October onwards, when everything goes back to normal, then you are going to be paying the full £15,000 that you would have done before all this craziness happened. And so that means that in the interim period between July and September, the maximum saving you can make on stamp duty because of these reduced rates would be £2,500. So it's a question of if you're thinking you're going to try and use this to be able to move, if you don't move by the 30th of June, which isn't very far away, then the maximum saving that you're going to make is £2,500 on stamp duty. That's a big difference from the £15,000 that we were talking about last year. So I'm not sure for a lot of people that's enough money to warrant them actually trying to move as a result of this scheme. But for people who are already in the process, it's still a saving. But it's interesting, on the complete aside, from people I talk to in the housing market, they are still seeing a flood of people leaving London and they're still struggling to sell houses, not in terms of sell them because people don't want them. They haven't got enough supply. They're selling houses incredibly quickly. So the market is still buoyant. I mean, it is partly the stamp duty holiday, but the market has picked up. I think people are looking to move anyway. So um, it would be interesting to see. I'm always amazed that they continue to taper that relief because it does feel that it just benefits a certain portion of the population, people who want to move house and, and, and by definition have assets so that's something a debate for another day and and obviously estate agents would be quite happy okay so moving on while we're talking about buying houses mortgage credit and everything like that can you talk a bit about people who are struggling to pay debts this was the notable exception in the budget that whereas previously there's been support for people who are struggling to pay their mortgage struggling to pay uh, credit cards or other debts uh, in the form of payment holidays you know there was a lot of a lot of people taking advantage of that mortgage payment holiday last year. There were some rumours that perhaps that scheme too would be extended, but actually they stopped short of doing that. So as it stands, the deadline is the 31st of March. So for people who are struggling with keeping up with payments on mortgages or other debts, They really need to hurry now if they want to make that 31st of March deadline. If they hadn't previously taken the full six months uh, that they're entitled to. So, yeah, if someone has taken three months holiday already, if they apply by the 31st of March, then they can extend that by another three months. Or if someone is facing new problems with it and they haven't previously taken a payment holiday, they can take out what should have been six months, but actually all of the scheme finishes on the 31st of July. Um, So they won't now get the full six months, but they could get up until that point having having a payment holiday on those debts. I mean, it raises the question whether it's a good idea to do that. For the mortgage holiday and the credit card um, payment holidays as well, the government has said that it won't feature on your credit file, uh, that it isn't going to affect your future credit worthiness or your capacity to borrow in the future. Whether that is slightly disingenuous, I'm not sure whether that actually will have an impact in the future. It remains to be seen. But I think especially with credit cards, especially um, with these products that have higher interest rates, you really need to be sure that you know what you're doing when if you take a payment holiday. Because what you need to remember is that that interest is still accruing for during the holiday period so at the end of it you will end up paying a much larger amount because you'll have your original debt plus the interest that you'll have accrued over that holiday time and just to add as well for people who are struggling who don't qualify for these payment holidays it's really imperative that you go and speak to your lender you speak to your credit card provider for example because the government has really made it clear to those uh, companies that they have to show support for their customers who are in financial difficulty. So they need to explore other ways of helping you, whether that be further holidays, a restructuring of your debt, or other measures. Also, it's worth noting that for those other measures, that will feature on your credit file. So I think that's it, Laura. I mean, I have to say, Andy, I don't know about you, but I found that the easiest podcast I've ever done because I basically Laura, <laughs> Laura did all the talking so 
<laughs> if anybody has any questions that they want to fire into Laura, you can do. It's laura at moneytothemasses.com is her email address. But as you heard there, Laura was talking a lot about credit towards the end. And if you've got any questions relating to that, Laura is our guru on all credit related issues. So if you want to ask questions of anything to do with credit cards, mortgages, or whatever it is, then do send them in. Because as you've probably realized, we're trying to get more of the team on the podcast going forward as well. And that's partly because you guys wanted that to happen as well. And it's good to hear some other voices. So Laura, thank you for covering the budget this week. Anybody who wants to see the highlights of what Laura spoke about, we did produce some really good infographics and they were shared on our socials. We will put them in the post on the website that relates to this particular episode so you can find them. So we've got one for self-employed, home buyers, businesses and workers. So go and have a look at those. So I think that's it for this week, Andy. That is it. Nice and easy this week. Thanks again to Laura. If you want to get in touch with Damien, of course, you can do so as normal. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter is at money to the masses with the number two. And of course, we've got the Facebook group as well, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the masses if you want to talk to some like-minded people whether it's budget or not and so laura thanks again for coming on the show thank you and damien until next time until next time 